Hello and welcome to Storical. I am your host, Peter Roberts. At Storical, we think your stories are historical. History is the story of you, and they deserve to be recorded and shared. Storical is the place you come to for advice on how to capture life story, tools to use, and how to complete your project. Listen to experts, memoir writers, and product reviews. Visit us at lifestoryprofessionals.com to read information that we talk about on Storical and to get free downloadable tips and to follow links and books that people on our show have written. Let's inspire you to start. Hello and thank you for joining us for episode 24 of Storical. Today's a little bit different. We're going to be speaking with Keith Larson. He is a freelance cartoonist illustrator and he was convinced by Patricia Hamilton to illustrate stories in the book Life in Pacific Grove that we spoke about in episode 13 and episode 14. Keith talks about cartooning and then he talks about specifically illustrating the book. He talks about the techniques he used and he talks about how he got to design the front and rear covers with with colour. The rest of the book is black and white illustrations. So let's listen to Keith talk about his experience. Welcome to Historical Keith. Thank you very much. Great. Keith, can you tell me your job title? I uh, started out as a freelance cartoonist. I guess that's what you would say. Um, Freelance cartoonist illustrator. And you've been doing that your whole life? Pretty much. um, in grade school, school, of course, I used to draw cartoons for my friends and in school. So I guess you could say I've been doing it pretty much my whole life. There have been times in my life when I was working at it more than I do now. But uh, it's something that never seems to quite go away. I, there's always some kind of an opportunity to um, do some illustrations or cartoons for people. So how did you become interested in cartooning? Um, I've I've tried to think about that over the years. Um, Again, it started at a very early age. I was just fascinated fascinated by the comic strips in the newspaper and also the the old animated cartoons that used to be shown on on television, the old uh, ones that used to be shown before the movies, the, the cartoon shorts. They seem to be. They seem to end up on every type of local television type of show. Uh, and here we had a show called Captain Satellite, and he used to show these old cartoons on his hour-long program. And I, I was just always fascinated by cartoons, and the comic strips were like friends. They. They came every day in the newspaper, and I would read them, and I would even uh, cut them out um, and collect them into a book, which I still have. I would even go out into the forest here in Cedar Grove, and lots of people would throw their papers away, and I would uh, cut them out of the papers there, and I was just always fascinated by that art form. It's an art form to me in two different ways, because you not only have to be good graphically in terms of being able to draw the thoughts and draw the animation from one box to the next box. But you also have to make the dialogue or make them uh, funny or s- satirical. What's what's your approach to doing those two things at the same time? Well, that's interesting you would bring that up because really I feel the writing is the main part of the cartoon. Um, There was a a cartoonist, local cartoonist here named Gus Ariola, who uh, did a comic strip, very beautiful comic strip called Gordo for many years. And he would always say that he just designs the page. He doesn't try to be funny, but I don't think he was giving himself enough credit here. He was a good writer too. So you you do need to be able to have something to say and with a comic strip of course you have to do it very briefly so that you just can't use a lot of words in a a space that's so small 
it's different with graphic novels and uh, that sort of genre. But with the newspaper cartoon, the idea is to get the point across with as few words as possible, and sometimes also with the graphics to make them simple enough to get the idea across because people want to get on to the next comic strip and they don't have a lot of time to spend. So if you have an idea, you, you, you really want to say it briefly and then design the, the graphics to support the idea. Uh, it's, it may not be that way with all cartoonists. They, they have their own take on this uh, subject of writing, but for me, it, it kind of starts with an idea that I've heard or that I've thought of or a conversation, and then somehow I work it out into what we call a single panel cartoon or a multi-panel cartoon. And did you work in your career with newspapers? Was that where you mostly did your cartoons? Mostly where I did my cartoons were in magazines. Now, when I started, uh, the, really the golden age of magazine cartoonings had ended. Um, the, the, big, the big monthlies like Look in Life and uh, Saturday Evening Post, the, the bigger magazines all used cartoons at that time. And that's pretty much where you started. You started in, in magazine cartooning, and then the hope was that you would be syndicated. So I started with magazine cartooning. And at that time, most every profession had a, had a magazine, and a lot of them did still use cartoons. The big monthly magazines, uh, their, their day was finished. Um, there was a few. I was in Cosmopolitan a couple times. There was a new one started called Lear's Magazine, started by Norman Lear's wife. And so it was really fun getting into the New York magazines. But mostly what it was uh, was these magazines that were for, for different pr professions, like we would say teaching magazines, human resource magazines, even I uh, got in one called the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. And these, these magazines were all over the country. I would send out my brochure and say, does your magazine use cartoons? And if it does, please uh, send me your magazine and I will read it and think of some ideas for you and send it back. And that's the way I got into many magazines. Also, I had written some cartoons and sent them out to uh, different syndicated cartoon cartoonists who sometimes use writing other than what they think of. They use gag writers. They, use, they have a staff sometimes. And I had sent some ideas out to Bob Thaves, who had a popular comic strip called Frank and Ernest. Frank and Ernest might have been in an 800 papers. I'm not quite certain, but he called me up and said, you know, I like these ideas. I'd like to use them for my Sunday pages. So although I didn't get my name on them, he used many of my, my cartoon ideas, my writing for his Sunday pages. So I did a little of that. That was fun to be in the newspapers, but I, at least to this date, I've never had my own uh, syndicated cartoon. If you start a cartoon, a syndicated cartoon, and it's popular, you might want to hire or keep on retainer writers who will keep the material coming, understand the papers come out every day. So that can eat up a lot of material. And sometimes a cartoonist will hire gag writers, uh, humor writers, to help come up with some of the ideas for his comic strip. Not all of them did that, of course. Uh, Hank Ketchum had a staff and Charles Schultz did, did the work himself. He had a lot of pride in his comic strip and he did the inking and the lettering and the uh, writing of his comic strip himself because he just felt very close to it. There are others that have uh, staffs. Garfield has a staff, Jim Davis. He's got inkers and he's got someone to work on the Sunday pages and pencilers and anything to do with the production of a comic strip. So you can have a big staff to do your strip or you can do it by yourself. For me, I, I was a magazine cartoonist and also a gag writer and supplied um, written material for the comic strip Frank and Ernest. 
So you would have had to have been across current affairs or you'd need to have drawn on some ideas to make a cartoon that was relevant at that time for the monthly magazine. Yeah, well, there was two types of cartoons. You know, the general humor, we'll call it general humor, and then what they used to call the magazines where they served uh, um, professional people, we used to call those house organs. In a house organ, you'd have to really read the magazine, like, for instance, a machinist or a teacher or, let's see, I'm trying to remember some of the ones I was in that were unusual. I had a lot of teaching magazines and a lot of business magazines. But you would have to gear your material towards um, the audience. And for the general humor magazines, that would be the big, big monthlies or Saturday Evening Post or some of the tabloids. That was more general humor, something that anyone could relate to. You would need to read their magazine to understand what kind of issues they were facing. So then you could um, think about how you would put that into a cartoon form. Exactly. You would have to read and then you would come up with something that you feel they could relate to and that they could laugh at. There was a saying that we used to have as cartoonists that were in this type of businesses. You want to laugh with, not at. So you, you wouldn't want to make fun of them in some way that they would feel offended. You would want to to make something that they something about their their job or their uh, working life that would be funny to them. Tell us which was your favorite type of cartoon, the one that was general or the one that was the um, house organ. I I sort of like general humor because I could I could really it wasn't so narrow. I could come up with um, a lot of different ideas for for a general type of, of magazine but even the general like cosmopolitan they had um that was a women's magazine of course still is i'm not sure they use many cartoons or even if they even use cartoons anymore but they used a lot of them back when i was doing them and you would look for things like mother and daughter relationship type of things or fashion or any kind of new technology that was coming and if you could weave that into a cartoon idea they would buy it it's it's general humor but still it's kind of focused i think saturday evening post which i never was in was a little more general but family oriented type of cartoons but still general humor we're talking about the difference between something that is so focused like a, a union magazine rather than a a magazine that has more of a, a broad appeal. And so I would say, yes, I would say something where I could just see something funny or think up something funny and um, submit that would would be my favorite. So because it's just not so narrow. To me, that means that you would need to be pretty attuned to, I don't know, to people's emotions, uh, putting together their situation and their emotion because comedy is always about two things juxtaposed together that don't make sense. It's a different level of consciousness because you're thinking of something that everyone can relate to, but they're not exactly conscious of it. And if you you can use a catchphrase, some kind of a catchphrase that everybody knows in your cartoon and bring out this thing that everybody can relate to, but at the same time, they're not exactly conscious of it. As soon as they see the cartoon, they can laugh because they can relate to it and uh, it brings up what they really already know, but it's just not something they're thinking about. It's very tricky. It's kind of like um, you're, you're coming up with a kind of a surprise ending or twist, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to explain. But the, the humorist will see things and hear things that maybe others will pass by, but at the same time, he can say to himself, wow, that's something I think everybody can relate to. And even if it doesn't come in a complete idea, the cartoonist or writer will will make it into a form that the audience can relate to. That certainly takes a lot of skills. It takes the skill of being a humorist, looking at things from a different level, as you say, you know, bringing 
I mean, because things to us are sometimes so obvious that we don't say them, but that's exactly what the humorist does, don't they? They have to say them and then they illustrate them. That's that's very multi-talented to me. Yes, it's um, right now there's a, I feel there's a lot about cell phones that people are, on the one hand, they're getting kind of frustrated with them, but there's not a lot being said right now about it. So I'm starting to, sometimes cartoons will come from my own frustrations about things and I'll, I'll make it into a cartoon because that helps soften it for me. I don't get so angry or serious about it. And that helps someone else laugh too. But it also is pointing out something that, to me, cell phones are very evasive. They, they cut into conversations. Uh, they go off, in, you know, in places where trying to focus. And this, to me, is getting to the point where I can say, say some things that I know others will relate to. And that's kind of what, what I look for. So cell phones are kind of like a rude child who's never been taught any manners. Well, that's true. Two adults trying to talk and there's a child and they're interrupting and it's always, uh, be quiet, I'm trying to, trying to talk, be polite here. But with our cell phones, uh, we don't really say that. <laughs> we either check them or I mean, see who's calling or most of the time they're, they're just always checking them. And I think I'm come to the point where if, if a child is interrupting, I think we need to listen to the child. I think maybe they have something to say. <laughs> For sure. Yes, I agree. Tell us how you got involved in illustrating the book Life in Pacific Grove with Patricia Hamilton. That was completely by surprise for me, like most things that happen in life seems to be. I took a graphic novel into her because I wanted some advice about it. I had finished it. I said, you know, I'm not sure this one's going to go, but maybe, um, and I'm not really working on anything else. And she mentioned the project Life in Pacific Grove, which was all volunteer, the, the proceeds, uh, any profit goes to the library. She said she'd really like someone to illustrate the, the book. And I thought, you know, I think I'd like to do this. And I really, it was a wild ride. I didn't realize how much work it would be and that it would be all year long. And, but something inside me just said, you know, give this book all you have. Go out there and just draw every day and fill up the pages with your illustrations because you probably won't get a chance to do this type of thing again. And my relatives have been in Pacific Grove since 1914. So it gave me a chance to have them represented in some of the stories, which I did write because I had some memories here of growing up in the 1960s and 70s. And it gave me a chance on my dedication page to just thank everyone who um, got me to 60 years old at that time. And so it was very special to do this book for my community and my relatives and family and, and just have that. as felt like a closure and an opener at the same time. But I just knew I had to do it. And I learned an awful lot. And I just hung on like Patricia Hamilton, the publisher, did as there was constant changes. We didn't know how many stories would come up. We didn't know we'd get enough stories at one point, And then we had a lot. The book is about 500 pages. Even though it was difficult, I just said to myself, well, and when it goes to publishing, when it goes to the printer in October, I'm done. But until that time, I'm going to keep adding illustrations, keep working with the stories. And so it was very gratifying. Did you illustrate every story? No. What I did was, a, of course, stories were being collected while I was illustrating, which is not usually the way you do it. An illustrator will, will want to read the story so they can get a feel for the pictures being made. Uh, I had to do it the opposite because the stories were coming in and I didn't get to read them as they were. I was out every day drawing and um, I, I knew the area, so I was drawing a lot of the places that were uh, popular uh, in the town, the, the oceanfront, the woods, and, and the little houses, and anything I could think of that the readers would, would relate to and that would fit in with the stories when they would come in. So it worked out very good, actually. Towards the end, when all the stories were in, Patricia Hamilton and I went over them and started doing specific drawings for 
for the story, uh, and which really rounded out the book quite quite nicely, I think. Can you describe your illustrations in the book? I use the style. You know, this is black and white book. I did do a color cover. But the illustrations, uh, I had learned how to use felt tip pens by a cartoonist in town named Bill Bates, very well known in the area. He had a studio and he did classes sometimes. And, and I felt for this black and white book that a style where I used pen and ink and then I used different grays, which were developed also into brushes. So I used different gradations, different tones and black and white to produce these illustrations, which I think were a very special technique to do. You don't see it very often. These illustrations were produced by hand in the plain air. As they say, I went out and did sketches. I didn't do them much from photographs. A few of them I did, but I just went out there with my pad of paper and my, my pens and my pencils. And, and it was fun talking with the people that would come by too. So you were in Pacific Grove itself doing these illustrations and people would wander by and want to know what you're doing? Oh yeah, anywhere. I'd be down at the ocean and sometimes a family would come by and maybe I'd draw some pictures of their children. They could take them, take them home. Or if I felt down that day, the best thing to do would be go out and draw because people are always complimenting me on my, my work. So it was like always a nice self-esteem building time to be out with the public and, and drawing. It was, it was very nice. One of the most unusual things that happened was Patricia Hamilton said, we have one golf story. And here, here we have in Pacific Road, we have many golf courses, you know. And so I said, well, I'll go over to the PG links and I'll start doing some sketches. So I was there on one of the tees drawing the golfers. This man came over and oh, I said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm doing some illustrations for the book Life in Pacific Grove. One person has sent in a golfing story, and I wanted to get a few illustrations here on the link. And he said, I sent in a story about golf. My mouth dropped open because he was the one that sent the story in. And the timing, we were both there at the same time. We hadn't planned any of this. I didn't know him. And I said, well, this is pretty amazing here. His name was King Grossman, and he has a local television show uh, Artivism on uh, on our local cable. So I said, tell me about your story. And he said, it's uh, called Pearls in the Mist. It's about a goddess in the lighthouse. If you're playing the back nine, if the light's just right, you can see her. So I said, oh, I've got to do a special illustration just for that, that story. So I did it. And uh, well, this was quite a mystical experience having this happen. That was just one of the amazing stories of this book. So the illustrations for the book, um, it, it was just a, a reflection of what the story was. Is that correct? Some of them required humor. The ones where I just went out and sketched, I sketched some of the places that I felt closest to and some of the things that I had grown up seeing my whole life. And those were special. So I, I went and sketched those. I'm a fine artist too. I can do sketching. And I had an art teacher one time that said, you know, Keith, if you learn to draw, um, it'll just be all, all that more exciting for you. So she knew I wanted to be a cartoonist, but she also felt that it would be best for me to learn to draw, which I, I did. So I could do both. So some of the illustrations were more cartoony and some were more kind of borderline and, and more fine art. How did the stories, how did you know what to draw? How did the stories inform you? I mean, did you... Uh, the stories hit you in a certain way and you decided to take one aspect of it and draw that? Tell us your process. The process is not just one way. Uh, I think if I had to choose one way that, that I do the illustrations most of the time, it's if I read a story, it's trying to get the feeling, somehow get the feeling of what the words are. Or you could read the story and if there's really something that stands out, you do an illustration of that, of describing that, that something that uh, is standing out in the story. So, for instance, there was a story about a house here that had some gargoyles on it in rock. And I felt, well, I think I need to illustrate those. It also helps because you're giving a picture and a, and a visual to the words. So I look, I, I try to do that also. 
but it can it's varying you you read a story and it can take you anywhere in your in your mind and it, to create a visual can take you down many different paths right and i guess we'll have our own reaction to a particular story and we have different feelings when we see something when we read about something and have different feelings and it sounds like you've let that guide you to figure out what you want to draw. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of putting it. And when someone sees a, a visual, they'll also have a, a reaction to that too. And hopefully the visual will maybe help illustrate something in the story, maybe reinforce it or bring something out that is, that is different. And, and adds to the to the uh, writing. I can see that. So I'm looking at the back page of the book, and I'll describe it. There is there's a big sign that says "Welcome to Pacific Grove, Butterfly Town, USA," and behind the sign there's trees and there's a village. You can see the houses and shops and the landscape typical to Pacific Grove. And in front of the sign there's a pathway. On the pathway there's a butterfly. A monarch butterfly, obviously, and it's it's got its carry case, its luggage. It's taking its luggage with it. Did you design that before or at the end of the book? When the book first started, that was going to be the cover. And then it was decided that perhaps the cover should have some diff different elements and that maybe it shouldn't be so cartoon looking. I said, well, just give me another crack at it here. I think I can come up with something better. I decided on doing it in color pencil, and that's what's on the front cover. Now, the, the, the back cover of the butterfly you described, I still like very much, and I'm glad that she did use it on the back cover there. I, I think that really was a good idea, and it's something that people really like to see. Just kind of clever. This is Butterfly Town, and... and Butterflies are, are very big here, and we all had to dress up a lot like them when we were in school, and I felt really proud of that particular idea. People really like that. Uh, the front cover is nice too. Yeah. The front cover is a pencil drawing. It, it's it got three or four different structures on the front page, and in and between the buildings there is the typical trees that you find down at Forest Grove. There's deers grazing, and there's a fellow under a tree reading, I think. But I love the backdrop. The backdrop, it reminds me of the cliffs and it reminds me of the fog that comes in to that area. Yes, this is one thing that Patricia Hamilton helped design the, the background. And this is one thing she, thing that she wanted was kind of that feeling of the fog and the trees in the background. And those three buildings, of course, are, are very well known in town. The clock tower and the, the Hart Mansion and of course the lighthouse. So those three elements and the trees in the background and fog was what she wanted to have. And I think the color, I think the cover turned out very well. The, the colors and the use of the colored pencils makes it very personal. This whole book is a very personal book because it's, it's stories from people that have grown up here or people that have visited and very personal memories of this town and, and, and impressions of this town. So the, the illustrations and the processes uh, and the final product all seems much more personal than a book that's just kind of stamped out and put on the shelf there to sell. Yes, I can see that. Yes, totally. Um, you must have enjoyed it. How long did the process of illustrating the book take? Oh, I think about a year, actually, maybe a little less than that, but uh, about a year of doing it and um, redoing it. We would get the roughs back and maybe some of the pictures weren't as clear as they should be. So I had to thicken up the lines on some of them and think more graphically. And it was a long process, but I feel extremely worthwhile to do. And it really something that I could really give to everyone here in Pacific Grove. So as a personal historian, we tend to put photographs in our book. And I'm just wondering the application of illustrating and putting in hand-drawn illustrations to life story narratives. Do you have any views about that or can you help us out on 
what to look for or what to think about? I mean, in terms of your views about the role of illustrations in illustrating someone's memoir. Oh, I think it'd be very important for that to be. Um, I think photographs certainly have their place. But I also think that some of the feelings might come out in a stronger way or, or even be more supportive to people's uh, life stories if they were done by artists. I guess there isn't an awful lot of hand-done illustrations, not as much as there used to be in books, and, but it would really be nice to, uh, to see more of that in books and, uh, and especially for people's uh, life stories. For guests on my show, I always like to ask them if someone's been considering capturing their life story, how, what kind of advice would you have for them? What advice do you have for up and coming illustrators or up and coming artists who might be tempted to get into life story with illustrations? And I'm wondering whether you've got advice for them perhaps. Things are always wide open for experimentation. If someone was an illustrator uh, and wanted to do some illustrations for people that have stories to tell about their lives, there are people uh, all over who help help people get their, their life stories published. And I would first go to them and see if there was any, any stories that they could work with, just kind of get their feet wet. Maybe if it, even if it wasn't a lot of money or any money at all, they could at least do it and see if that was something they they liked to do. There is certainly a lot of people out there that are that are wanting to tell their stories, and illustrations, hand done illustrations, would make them even more personal. It could be a field that's really um, unexplored. Do you still illustrate uh, as a business? Not as much anymore. I I do do some fun things here in town in Pacific Grove. I have some comic strips that appear in our local paper, uh, Cedar Street Times, and I have one or two comic strips in a, in a publication called Foolish Times. At one time in my cartooning career, I was cranking out a lot of cartoons every week and putting them in the mail, and I don't really do that any longer. I always, I always keep my hand in it, and there are things that come up that are of interest, and I do them. Cartooning and illustrating and any kind of art is, is always possibility. All you have to do is, is find a niche in a place or a dream and, and you, can, you can make it happen. If you want to do cartoons or illustrating, I just encourage anybody out there to experiment and knock on doors, send their stuff out, talk to editors, talk to the people that are in the business, in the schools, and, and uh, You'll find your you'll find your path. I certainly appreciate speaking to you today. Thank you so much, Keith, for being on Storical today. Well, thank you so much. I, I really had a good time doing this. Thank you for joining me in another episode of Storical. Feel free to let me know how you like Storical, either on iTunes or where you get your podcasts. Or you can email me, Peter P E T A at storical, S-T-O-R-Y-I-C-A-L dot com. Come to our website at lifestoryprofessionals.com to get more information about the episode you heard today. The website has free downloadable tips and links and books that people on our show have written. May Historical inspire you to story the historical because it's never too soon to get started, but often it can be too late.